That is a powerful song. (sighs) Took my sin, took my blame, bore the wrath. Because of that, I stand here before you forgiven. And you sit there if you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior forgiven because of the awesome cross. And that, doesn't that sound weird for us to be able to say an awesome cross so I know, uh, that they crucified our perfect and loving Savior on? But if it wasn't for the cross, we might as well be on the streets of Portland burning the city down. But we aren't because we stand forgiven. Remember that, we stand forgiven, because that's an important part of what we're talking about today. Open your Bibles to uh, Ephesians 6. We're going to just read the one verse we're uh, dealing with today. I might go ahead and read the context. (laughs) I'll start with with verse 10, because uh, it's so, so imperative that we get this whole concept of the whole armor of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We will stop with verse 15 this morning because this is where we're, we're landing. We're landing on this verse. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I've titled this message... These boots are made for, now if you're over 50, you're going to say what? These boots are made for walking. (laughs) And one of these days, these boots are going to walk all over you. (laughs) And maybe you don't have to be 50 to, to, to make that connection. But today we're going to ask the question, but are they made for walking? What are these boots for? And that's where we'll be going. But before we get there, we need to kind of just review where we've we've been. Because we're working on putting on the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. And I use that whole phrase because every word of that is important. The whole. Every bit of it. Every piece of it. You know, we cannot leave any place in in our... armor that leaves a a weakness. We've got to cover ourselves as completely as we possibly can because Satan is devious. And we know we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We, we, you know, I joked about Pelosi, but they're not the enemies. You know, they're not the enemies. We wrestle against principalities and powers. We're against Satan. It's the wiles of the devil we're fighting against. And so we can't afford to have any part of our armor askew or out of place or missing. We've got to put on the whole armor of God, not just a couple of pieces, but the whole armor. And we have been looking at that as we uh, have continued our study through Ephesians. I mean, uh, this is our 32nd week in Ephesians, and uh, we aren't done yet. <laughs> but uh, but as, we, as we come to this point, how, how timely it is to think about the spiritual warfare that we are in. Uh, as as I mentioned in my prayer to men's breakfast yesterday, I mean, we we talked about how contentious it is. Every place is contentious in Washington. It's contentious in Portland. It's contentious in, in our communities. It's contentious in our churches. You know, it's contentious every place. This is the most contentious time <laughs> in my lifetime. And I've seen uh, a lot of things over my 25 years. 
And so it's essential that we put on the whole armor of God. And, and so we've, we've already looked at two essential pieces of the army, armor. We looked, first of all, as at the belt of truth. The belt of truth. We talked about the significance of the belt that they would, they would put on, uh, the, the duty belt that they'd have with their, with their uh, swords and their, their knives and their, their food more than likely. Uh, they didn't have Rosie to cook for them, so they, uh, they had to provide their own food uh, along the way. But the main thing about the belt of truth is that it's founded on the truth. And God starts with the truth because the truth is extremely important to, to God. I mean, he is truth. His word is truth. It's all about truth. Jesus came full of truth. You know, and he hates hair. He hates lies. In fact, he said to the, to the, uh, the hypocrites in the synagogue, he says, you're a liar and you are, your father is the father of all lies. And nobody should believe you. The truth does several things for us that are very important in our battle. It gives us stability. Because the, 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 the belt was not, not a belt like we have, but a, a more like a, a back brace type belt that would, uh, that would help support their, their battle. When they, because those shields, we're going to talk about the shield of faith. Those shields are heavy. And they, they needed the stability. You got a big old sword in one hand and a big old shield in the other hand. And you and you got on the uneven terrain and you're... You, get, you have a dress on, which, they, which is another purpose of the, uh, of the belt, to pick up their tunic and tuck it in there so they don't get tangled up in it and, and trip over their own, their own clothing. I mean, it gives them stability. You know, in, the, in, a, in a world that's, that's full of, of lies and, and fighting and, and, you know, nothing is, seems stable, Right here, man. We can pick this book up and we can read it and it's the truth and we, we find stability. When the foundations of the earth are shaken, what will the righteous do? We'll look at the truth. It gives us stability. It enables us to stand. We already mentioned they don't trip over their, their tunics as, as they battle. It, it helps them to be able to, to stand in the battle. And not go down. It also uh, keeps us balanced. The truth keeps us balanced. You know, it, we, it, we, we're people of extremes. You know, uh, people, and you see it, they, they're like pendulums. You know, one extreme to the other. You know, but, but God's word keeps us balanced. So we don't go crazy, you know, one way or the other. But he t the truth keeps us balanced right in the middle. And that's important as we go into battle. So we looked at the belt of truth. But then last week we looked at the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. We talked about the breastplate that was made out of, early on, very thick leather. And maybe several layers of leather. Uh, and eventually as metal became more... Uh, more advanced and things, they were able to make the the shield, the uh, breastplates out of of metal. But they would it would cover their front and their back. And the purpose of the breastplate, as you recall, was to protect the vital organs, protect the vital organs. You know, he, you know, I mentioned my brother. You know, my my brother nine years ago had a bad heart. They fixed that nine years ago, and now he's got bad heart and bad kidneys. You know, those. That's two vital organs that are, that are in trouble. You know, God wants us to put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect the vital organs, but particularly the heart, particularly the heart. And as we looked last week about the heart, we saw that, you know, it is, the, it is representative of, of who we are. It's, it's representative of what we believe, of how we live, how we think, how we speak. The heart is extremely vital. And we talked about what this righteousness is. This righteousness is practical righteousness. We talked about the fact it's not imputed righteousness. It's certainly not self-righteousness because we have none. But it's, it's practical righteousness. 
what we mean by practical righteousness, it's our day-to-day holiness as we walk with the Lord. We as believers, people ought to be able to look at us and see there's something different about us. They may not know what it is until we tell them it's Jesus. But they ought to be able to tell there's something different about you. And if they can't, then that's on us. Because we ought to be living a life that's, that's clean, that's holy, that's righteous. And they ought to be able to see it. That doesn't mean we go around, you know, with uh, you know, a thing on our forehead and say, I am a Christian and I am good. No, they, they have to see it because they hear people talk about everything a lot. Society is full of people that talk big talk. But as we know, talk is cheap. They want to see actions. How are you living? How are you living? How are you talking? Where are your priorities? They want to see that personal walk with the Lord. And we are to, gui- to guard, excuse me, guard our hearts with holy living. So we start with those two articles of the, the armor, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Now as I reflected on that, it seems that the Lord is setting, getting our foundation secure. You know, starting with truth and righteousness because those, those are concepts which God speaks about a lot in his word. Truth and righteousness. Very important concepts to the Lord. In fact, remember, does anyone happen to remember the number that of the times truth was mentioned in the scripture? I don't really expect that. I mean, but, but I thought someone might. I know you're brilliant. But uh, 212 times in the scripture, the word truth is used. That's a lot. 212 times, and those are verses. There's been sometimes more than once in a verse. So 212 verses, truth is, is used. And that's in a staggering amount, but you know what's used even more? I bet you can guess. <laughs> Righteousness, used in 296 verses in the scripture. 296 verses. So truth, I mean, doing my math real quick, that's over 500 times. <laughs> Those two words are used in the scripture. And sometimes he's used them together. In at least 25 scriptures I found. He uses both truth and righteousness in scriptures such as Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Maybe that's why, maybe that's why he's so important. Uh, concerned about making sure the foundation of our life is righteousness and truth. If the foundation of his throne is righteousness and truth. You follow? You picking up what I'm putting down here? You know, they, he's, this is important, these are important concepts. The foundation of his throne is righteousness and so the foundation of our lives ought to be righteousness and truth. The second Corinthians 6, 7 says, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. And Psalm 15, 1 and 2 says, Lord, who may, be, who may be able to abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. So you see, it's no wonder that he starts with these Two concepts of righteousness and truth. And, and as we noticed last week, when these things are not present, and I didn't put up the whole passage, this time the passage is a little longer than this, but in Isaiah 59, 14, he says, Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands far off. Truth has fallen in the street. And equity cannot enter. You want justice? You want equality, put righteousness and truth where it belongs. But our society has put righteousness and truth as totally unimportant. 
and has fallen in the streets, literally. So righteousness and truth are essential to the foundation of our lives. So as we come today, we find that he continues to work on the foundational aspect as he ties these things together in Psalm 85.10. He says, mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. I thought that was an interesting verse in the context of, of what we're studying here. Righteousness and peace have kissed and mercy and truth have come together. So today, the third piece of armor we're going to look at is the boots of the gospel of peace. The boots of the gospel of peace. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, I got to say, there's hardly anything more foundational than footwear. I mean, especially for us adults. Now, I, I'm amazed when I see children, and I, I was one once a few years ago. But I remember being able to run outside barefoot and run across gravel. Of course, I weighed 25 pounds, which is a few pounds, you know, three or 400 less than I'm wearing now. But, you know, I was able to, to run across gravel. But, man, now... If I walk outside my bare feet and I hit this one little piece of gravel on the sidewalk, oh, wow, wow, wow. There's nothing more foundational than footwear. So if God's working on our foundation, the foundation of righteousness and truth, he's got to come to deal with our feet. Because most battles are not fought on astroturf. Most battles are fought in rugged terrain. And what you have on your feet is pretty important. In fact, the word preparation, that it says the preparation of the gospel of peace, can, be, can mean foundation. So we're talking about something that, of course, all, all these pieces are important, obviously, but he start, it's significant to me where he starts as he builds a foundation. Because we know it's difficult to fight if your feet are bothering you. What's that one doing up there? I don't know how that got up there. That was unintentional. <laughs> we can get some testimonies here this morning about how hard it is to do anything with your feet hurt. You know, if your feet, you know, the, the importance of footwear cannot be overstated. Let me uh, give you a little historical background of what we're talking about. The boots of the first century were, <laughs> I call I called them enhanced sandals. I looked up the, some history on them and they were, they were not boots like we think of obviously. Uh, when we think of work boots or, or combat boots, army boots or whatever. Uh, but they were you know, not the traditional sandals most people of the day would wear. They were they were sandals, but they were they they had far more leather, far more enclosed, so that they, you know you, you wouldn't hit your your feet on the rocks. Uh, you know, but they they were far more enclosed. And if you see pictures, they usually were fastened up to the leg to keep them from falling off. You didn't want to lose your shoe in the middle of the battle. I mean, you see a football player use it, lose their shoe once in a while, they got to stop, they got to go out of the game for a while to put their, put their little shoe on. But they were, they were laced up their, their calf so that they would not fall off. And they were also, uh, they also usually had small nails or pieces of metal driven into the soles, not this way, but this way, <laughs> so that they could get stability. They could get stability. They were, uh, I would say they were the forerunners of the spikes and cleats that we use today. This, this concept, you know, 
You wouldn't see a baseball player, at least not in professional level, go out without cleats or track runners without spikes or football players go out with, without their cleats. And, you know, it, the importance of it is so significant because every once in a while, mostly before AstroTurf, you know, you'd hear commentators say, well, they had to go in and change their cleats during halftime because they weren't getting enough traction. You know, the importance of, of footwear is extremely important. Now, when we think about the footwear, their footwear needed to be comfortable. They needed to have, be able to not have sore feet. They needed to not be able not to have to worry about them falling off. They didn't have to worry about getting blisters and all these other things. They had to be comfortable. These words may come back, so you might want to pay attention to them. <laughs> they also needed to be secure. In other words, they didn't want to fall them off, falling off. Didn't want to throw a shoe in the middle, <laughs> middle of a battle. And they needed to be stable. Hence the metal spikes and the pieces of metal that would grip, give them a good grip in the middle of battle. So those three things, they needed to be comfortable, they needed to be secure, they needed to be stable. And the fact are, my dear friends, we need those same things to be true in our spiritual battles that we face. And so he says... Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, before we go too far into that, I think it's pretty ironic that the way we stand in a war is with boots of peace. Is that, is that a little, uh, I seem a little ironic? That the way we stand in war is with boots of peace. So we got to look at what that, what that concept of peace here is means. Now, peace has been very significant in the book of Ephesians. As we early on, we're going through the book of Ephesians, and we, we read about the peace that Jesus Christ makes for us in uh, 2, 14 and 15. He says, for he himself is our peace. He has made both one and broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Okay, so early on in the book of Ephesians, he said the way to peace is through Jesus Christ. The way to peace is through Jesus Christ. In fact, the only way to peace is through Jesus Christ. You know, these poor people that are all worked up and in such turmoil, they need, they need to know the Prince of Peace, man. They need to know the one that can give them peace when they are so upset about everything. <laughs> we know one who is our peace. In verse 17 of the same chapter in chapter 2 says, And he came and preached peace to you who were far, afar off and to those who were near. Jesus came to bring peace with himself being the peacemaker, and himself being the only way to peace. You know, when we sang the curtain torn in two, you know, in the power of the cross, you know what that referred to? That referred to the time when, when Jesus Christ died on the cross and God reached down and, and, and there was a separation between the holy place and the holy of holies and that the people couldn't go. Even regular priests couldn't go there. Only the high priest could go there once a year. And God, when Jesus died on the cross for us, he reached down, grabbed that curtain from top to bottom, the scripture points out, and ripped that thing right in two so that we could have access to the Prince of Peace. And we could know that peace that comes from knowing Jesus. And he came and preached that to us. And then our job following that up is, in chapter 4, verse 3, is to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That means that we're supposed to be at peace with one another. As much as possible, be at peace, uh, Peter said. It's a very important 
concept in the book of Ephesians, the peace that Jesus Christ brings, the peace of the brotherhood, the prince of peace, says having your, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, as I study the, these concepts, you know, I, I do some studying and do some research and see what other people are thinking. And, and uh, you know, there's two ways. There's two ways of thinking concerning these boots of the gospel of peace. Maybe more than that, but two main ones. One group of, uh, of thought is that these boots are made for sharing. These boots are made for sharing, not walking, but for sharing. And that centers in on the concept of the gospel. Because we all know what we're supposed to do with the gospel, right? We're supposed to preach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our mandate. That was Jesus' last concern is our, our, should be our, one of our greatest concerns. It should be our greatest concern to make sure that everybody knows Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And so when we talk about the gospel of peace, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one who tore that wall, that wall partition down and gave us access to the Father, that is sharing him. And we know that God is pleased, very pleased, with those who share the gospel. And we know that from two passages, one original and one a follow-up quote and expansion of it. In Isaiah 52, verse 27, he said, or excuse me, 52, verse 7, he says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaim peace, who bring tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. These feet of those who proclaim peace, who bring tidings, who proclaim salvation. Many think that this is why these boots are made for sharing, to present the gospel. And Romans then follows up on this, quotes this and, and expands on it in uh, verses 10 to 13, chapter 10, verses 13 to 15. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they then call upon him who has not believed? And how shall they believe of him who they have not heard? And how, the, how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace who bring glad tidings of good things. You can understand why these, this, this thought comes here that the gospel of peace means we go and tell people about the prince of peace, the one who comes to give them peace, the one who, give, who, who came to draw men to, them, to himself and bring salvation. The preparation aspect of the gospel could re refer to the readiness to present the gospel. One of the favorite verses we, we throw around here is uh, 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And Colossians 4.6 says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So we can understand this system of thought that says this gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace must have to do with us sharing that gospel with others. Now we know that and I've found this true in my life, and I'm pretty sure that you have if, if you've ever shared Jesus Christ. We that are actively sharing Jesus Christ with others, we become stronger ourselves. There's several reasons for that. One, we're being obedient to the scripture. The Lord will bless, will bless our efforts for, for following what we're supposed to do. But also, when you share Jesus Christ and you share the truth, 
And oftentimes people have questions and you say, you might have to say, uh, I don't know about that, but I'll get back with you. you. You study the word a little harder. You pray a little harder. When you, when you are sharing Jesus Christ, I don't know about you, but I'm always praying, God, give me the right word to say here because I, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I, I don't necessarily, you know, everybody thinks, wow, I don't share the God. Quote, I don't share the gospel because I may not be able to answer questions. Well, who can? Who can? Only God can. But we get stronger because we pray more, we study more, and we're being obedient. So if you're going to go into battle, share the scripture. Share, the, share Jesus with others. You will find yourself getting stronger. But one important thing I need to say is if you're going to proclaim the gospel, you better know what the gospel is. There's a lot of people out there proclaiming something they say is the gospel, but it's not the gospel. We need to make sure that our gospel is in righteousness and truth and truly what God says. Proclaim the gospel, we better know what the gospel is because the warning is in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, I marvel that you are turned away so soon from him who have called you into the, in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. We need to make sure that we are crystal clear on what the gospel is. The gospel is this. All of us are sinners before God, a righteous God. We are dirty and we are lost. Scripture says hopeless and helpless before, before God and without God. That sin will lead us to death. We will go to hell. But Jesus Christ came to make sure that didn't have to happen. He came to bring salvation through the blood of the cross. And we must accept that. We must ask Jesus Christ to, into our lives to take away our sins and to give us the righteousness of Jesus Christ to change our life forever. And he will. That is the gospel. We can't do anything ourselves to earn our salvation. We can never be good enough we can't buy our, our way into heaven. Only Jesus Christ could pay that price, and he did, through the power of the cross. We need to make be crystal clear of what the gospel is. I need to be, you need to be crystal clear that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So, one way of thinking is the, the boots of the gospel of peace refer to us actively sharing Jesus Christ. These boots could refer to us going to share the gospel. The second way of thinking is that these boots are made for standing. These boots are made for standing. Again, not walking, <laughs> but standing. And you can kind of understand this because this is based more on the context of this passage. This passage has a, a particular and distinct purpose. This passage is not so much about going, it's about standing. Kind of get that when we read through it, don't you? Because it says things like that you would be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. It says that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand and stand therefore. This passage, the context of the passage is about standing. It's not about going. It's about standing.
So we need to ask ourselves, what does it mean to stand in the boots of peace? What does it mean to stand in the boots of peace? Well, this is a duh statement, I think. <laughs> I feel like it's a duh statement. First of all, it means we must have peace with God. You know, because the scripture says that unless we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're enemies of God. We're not, we're not his children. We are his creation, but we are not his children until we become his children. And only he gives us the power to become the children of God that, to those that believe on his name. A person without Jesus Christ is an enemy of God. So it seems like a dust statement to say that in order to stand in the boots of peace, we must have peace with God. But it's the truth. It's a fundamental truth. And Romans 5.1 tells how that happens. Therefore, being justified, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so first and foremost, we need to make sure that we are in the faith. That we have peace with we are have peace with God because we know that the Prince of Peace, His Son, who came to make peace. It's all about peace through Jesus Christ. But first of all, if we're going to stand in the boots of peace, we have to have peace with God. But secondly, we must be confident in him. We must be confident in him to stand in the boots of peace. This is a wonderful verse that talks about Paul as he talks to a young pastor. And he tells this young pastor, he infers to the young pastor, you're going to go through war. And we know we do. But he says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. When we go to battle, we aren't standing in our own strength. Remember that. We've, we talked about that. We're standing in the power of the Lord. And we are confident as we go to battle that we may feel weak, but we are strong in him. I'm pretty confident that with all his uh, bravado and, and uh, confidence, when David went out to fight Goliath, there was a little fear there as he faced that, that big old giant. But he knew that it wasn't, he was, it wasn't going in his strength. He was going in the power of the living God. We must have that confidence. And Jeff referred to a verse yesterday morning from Jude, verse 24, which says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to him be glory for and ever and ever. We are standing in the power of Jesus Christ. When we go to battle with Satan, we can stand firm because we are confident in him and we have peace that he's able to take care of us. He's able to do what he said he would do. He's able to keep us from falling. He is able and we can have confidence in that. But thirdly, we also must be secure in him. We must be secure in him. Another verse we love to throw around here is Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We are secure in him. No force from the pits of hell can take us out because he started it and he's going to finish it. And to add to that, that powerful passage from Romans chapter 8, verses 37 to 39, 
Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, or death, depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we go into, when we go into the battle with Satan, we don't have to be afraid that Satan can take us to hell because Jesus has already given us eternal life. And no one, he says in John 10, 28, no one can pluck us out of the Father's hand. We are secure in him. So to, stay, me, to stand in the boots of peace, we must be at peace with God. We must be confident in him that he is able to do what he said he's going to do. And we must be secure knowing that we are his child. And nothing can ever change that. Well, when we started this discussion of the boots, we noticed that their, their footwear of the soldier needed to be comfortable. That means they're at peace with God. They're comfortable with God because they're his child. They are at peace. We noticed that those pe those that footwear must not only be comfortable, but must be secure. The scripture tells us, the scripture tells us, it's not my thoughts, not anybody else's thoughts, the scripture says that he that's begun the good work will finish it. We can be secure in our boots of the gospel. And then finally, he said they must be stable. We can trust in the one who's able to keep us from falling. He will not let us slip. His hands are strong. He promised us in Romans 5, 2, right after, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, through whom you also have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We stand having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So, I said there's two, two ways of thinking. So does it mean that these boots are made for sharing? Or does it mean that these boots are made for standing? I can dogmatically say, yes. Yes. They are made for sharing the good news of the gospel of peace. And we will find ourselves getting stronger as we actively share that gospel. But they're also made for standing. And standing strong. Because of who, who we are in Jesus Christ. I love this quote from a guy named F.F. F. Bruce. You don't know who it is, maybe, but F.F. F. Bruce is a, is a great Bible scholar, and uh, I really love his works. But he said this, those, and this was in his commentary on Ephesians, he said, those who must at all costs stand their ground need to have secure footing in the spiritual conflict. This is supplied by the gospel appropriated, standing, and proclaimed, sharing. We must have secure footing by supplied by the gospel, appropriated, and proclaimed. The gospel means good news. We have the best news. The best news that this world could ever receive if they just would. Our job, we cannot make them receive it. Our job is to proclaim it. And when we fight the, when we fight the spiritual battles, because I'm telling you what, if you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to enter into battle. Stand. Stand having your feet shod 
with the preparation of the gospel of peace, you will find that you have strength that you didn't know you had through the Lord Jesus Christ. So as always, when we come to the end of our messages, the message is pretty much clear through these, these passages. Having done all to stand. Stand with the sheet, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to appropriate it. That this would be true, that, that, that everyone in this, this room this morning would be absolutely 100% confident that they know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and if they would die right now, they'd go to heaven. If there's any doubt, Lord, help them to give their life to Jesus right now. Just reach out to you and say, I know that I need Jesus to take away my sins and give me a new life. And those of us that have done that, some of us many, many years ago, some of us not too long ago, help us to stand strong. Because we're in a battle, a battle for truth, a battle for righteousness. But the victory is through the gospel.